Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to our March Brooklyn Developmental Disabilities Council monthly meeting. Hope everyone had a good weekend. I know winter's back. That's not good. I don't know what happened to spring. Um, hopefully everyone's doing well and staying warm. First thing, as we get started from the Brooklyn Council, hopefully you all saw our emails. The Brooklyn Family Support Fair is returning Wednesday, June 5th at Brooklyn College. Registration opened up last week. Emails went out. It's on our website. I believe IAC shared it on theirs as well. Um, and it should be going out through all the different groups. As of this morning before the meeting, we had 60 registrants already and 18 of them being agencies. So I think that's a good start for being out for three or four days. So please continue to spread the word. Families, professionals, individuals, people that get support all can attend for free. The only people that have the only groups that have to pay is if you want a table. Um, and we have two different options, a four foot half a table shared with another agency or an eight foot table. All the information is in the flyer in the chat on our website through my emails. And OPW, MTA, um, any New York City state services will all be given a table for free if they were able to attend. And we'll give in will be given space outside of the big room so they can have some more in-depth conversations with people that need help with services or getting signed up for the Omni card, things like that. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I can definitely help you get set up and registered if you're struggling with that. Before we move on to updates, are there any announcements from any of our Brooklyn Council committees or chairs? Anyone want to plug any upcoming meetings? Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I could not unmute myself. Um, the Children's Services Committee meeting is going to be held this Wednesday, 930. We're looking forward to everyone coming in, participating, um, and trying to move our committee forward. We've been having um, some struggles with folks coming in, so please, we'll Put the info regarding the meeting in the chat. Um, spread the word out to your networks and your families so that we can increase our participation. Thank you. Thank Hello, you, Marjorie. It's Debbie. I want to just announce that the, the same day, April 15th, Monday, we'll be doing the advisory council will be doing a resource fair at the, with Carrie, thank you, Carrie, for the site in Greenpoint. And Chris and I will be participating by phone slash as best as we can virtually. But if you're, if I believe all our tables are booked, but that doesn't mean you can't come by and bring your information. We'd be very happy to see that it's shared. Thank you. And I know that I think Rose is there, but we still are doing on the ninth. We still will be doing the if it's the second Wednesday, the uh, the provider and family information. So I will recheck my notes and I'll discuss it later or put it in the chat. Thanks. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, before we move on to uh, update with OPW, I just want to welcome and thank Rihanna McKenzie for joining us. So she's a new representative from Department of Health and Mental Health, or mental hygiene. Um, and I know in the past we've had Gavin Myers here. Gavin has a new position with them. So Rihanna is now our friend and partner and joining us on our monthly meetings. So thank you, Rihanna, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. So hopefully in some future meetings, we'll get some updates or grant information or little tidbits from DOH like we used to get in the past. Definitely. Thank you. All right, so now I'll pass it off to Nina to get the OPWDD update. Thank you, Brian. Um, good morning to everyone. And I have some exciting updates that I would like to share today with the group. Um, on March 19th, just last week, OPWDD uh, and our uh, provider agencies launched a statewide direct support professional recruitment campaign, which is called More Than Work. Uh, this is a joint offer, um, uh, joint 
effort that will provide a central and user-friendly hub for job seekers to find the rewarding opportunities in our field and will help strengthen and grow the ranks of direct support workforce and it's so uh, valued and vital to our shared mission. The campaign goals are to educate the public and in particular the job seeking public about the importance and fulfilling the nature of direct support work and uh, we are planning and I, the, the purpose of it is to connect p- uh, potential job candidates to opportunities supporting New Yorkers with uh, DD across the state. Modern work will be visible throughout our communities with compelling, authentic TV and radio advertisements and on social and digital media. It will point interested job seekers to a central non-government website at directsupportscareers.com where they can connect directly to service agencies and to learn about the career opportunities that are available near them. The campaign was developed with funding from um, American Rescue Plan Act and with the input from our agencies, self-advocates, family members and members of diverse communities. Uh, marketing uh, firm Vibrant Brands has worked closely with OPWDD staff and the advisory committee to develop an effective campaign with a look and feel that will be targeted broadly, but also uh, specifically um, we are targeting uh, promising candidate pools. Early participation of many um, agencies has been a tremendous support. And if there are, if you know any agencies who have not yet joined this campaign, um, oh, please uh, do so. And they connect. Uh, they can connect to our communications office at communications uh, office at opwdd and y.gov. I can put. I will put the email in the chat. And there is no cost to join. It's not too late for providers to make sure that they are recruiting through this visible and moving campaign. Um, by, and by working together with service agencies, we continue to do everything in our collective power to address the workforce challenges that are impacting the lives of people we seek to support and empower. Um, so the website is live. And it's very user friendly. It's super easy to navigate. I encourage you uh, to uh, check it uh, whenever you get a chance. Um, it's the end of the March, but I still want to remind everyone, everyone that March is uh, Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. Uh, this year's uh, national um, uh, theme was a world is a world of opportunities. To celebrate this month, OPWDD has released three sets of videos focusing on empower, um, empowerment on, uh, of our DD uh, community. Um, the first set of videos was the art of advocacy, uh, where you can hear from self-advocates who are not afraid to speak uh, and to tell us uh, what advocacy means to them and what they hope uh, the future of advocacy will hold. Uh, the second set was a look beyond um, a series of videos that where you can learn how people with developmental disabilities choose to define themselves and how they want to see uh, to see them. And the third one, the third set is on sexuality with people with developmental disabilities. Um, where uh, people can be educated about the importance of providing information to people with developmental disabilities and supporting them in their sexual self-advocacy. This last series um, was developed in collaboration with training company Elevators and SANES, the Self-Advocacy Association of New York State, and uh, uh, with the filmmaker um, you know, from the University of Minnesota. And this, uh, these videos will soon will be followed by the online toolkit that will further assist self-advocates, professionals, and family members in supporting people with developmental disabilities in their sexuality and relationship. So that that is about the DD Awareness Month. Oh, uh, we... Um, if anyone wants to have the opportunity and to share their their own I am message, please do so again by sending an email to your community um, communications office at OPWDD. And if you just finished the sentence, I am, 
and, uh, and or or you can share um, share your own um, pictures on social media uh, with the hashtags um, uh, old beyond or um, developmental disabilities awareness month 2024 um, you probably heard that this uh, month in April, uh, we are going to, uh, to experience uh, the solar eclipse. And the solar eclipse um, will occur, the total solar eclipse will occur in uh, parts of upstate in New York on Monday, April 8th. Uh, in a total solar eclipse, people who are in the path of totality will see the sun's bright disk totally covered by the moon for a short time. Um, the total path will, um, the towns that will be, locations that, that will be affected by the solar eclipse are Jamestown, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Watertown, Plattsburgh, and it, it, it starts in Mexico and will go through, and um, uh, it will pass through uh, North America and uh, people in Canada will be able to observe that as well. And this is a rare event, and that occurs only once uh, uh, in, a, in the same place uh, every 400 years. And New York State is expecting a record crowd of sky watchers to travel to our state for optimum viewing. And New York State has been planning for this event since November of 2022 to ensure public safety in preparation of the anticipated influx of people from neighboring states. Um, uh, you can find resources for experiencing the solar eclipse, including a map and exact timing and where to find safety glasses at ilovenewyork.com um, events website, right? And um, uh, OPWDD has gathered some tips on how to prepare in advance of the uh, of the eclipse. It's just to be aware that we are expecting in, uh, extended traffic delays. Um, people should stock up for food and supplies uh, and plan ahead. Um, uh, people should consider scheduling their appointments on errands, um, uh, keeping your cell phones and laptops charged, uh, keeping the vehicles fueled so uh, to avoid those uh, long waits at the gas stations. And uh, it's never safe to look directly in the sun. And um, uh, sunglasses will not protect the eyes, so be mindful um, uh, of that. So uh, now I'm going to look, I just want to mention a couple of things about um, updates um, with, uh, with our ADMs. Um, last year, um, late in the last year, we have released a couple of the uh, ADMs for Group D Habilitability habilitation service documentation and community habilitation services provided in the residence and requirements. So those ADMs were added in response to the public comments that we have received. The public comments um, um, were published and added to the and attached to the ADMs and, uh, and uh, are available on our website. We, hope, we have also received public comments for the ADM uh, on remote delivery of HCBS services. And uh, the, these, this ADM have not changed, but we, uh, we couple of public comments were posted as well. Um, with the COLA updates, uh, provider community is uh, were waiting for a long time for April first, twenty twenty two cola updates and and um, fine and uh, we had delays because we had to make changes in HCBS waiver agreement to support the cola changes annual, so self direction PRAs and uh, fiscal inter intermediary. Uh, fees uh, were finally increased by 5.4%. Relatedly, individuals have, um, have the choice to increase the support broker fee or the wages of self-hired staff by 5.4%, and the inclusion of 5.4% COLA in the PRAs and, if, um, yeah, yeah, were, and the fees uh, 
uh, as I said, they, it was uh, they were delayed because of the uh, of the changes that we had to uh, get uh, in a in a waiver. Um, and uh, just a reminder that uh, OPWDD has transmitted April first, twenty twenty three, four percent quality certification survey. Um, last year, we have um, sent the link for the survey to be completed by the agencies, and the certification is due back by April 1st, 2024, for the agencies who have not responded uh, yet. Um, I want to uh, give you some updates about uh, some other ACPA projects that uh, OPWDD is working on. Uh, last year, uh, we have launched uh, a partnership with Georgetown University National Center for Cultural Competence with the goal of advancing policies and practices of diversity, equity, cultural and li uh, linguistic competence in all components of the DD system of New York. And this is very exciting and interesting because uh, this project, um, our state is the only state who is undertaking uh, this project at this time. So in spring of this year, Georgetown will host uh, virtual forums for providers across the state and C CEOs of the agencies or their staff uh, will be invited to participate in these forums. Each forum will be 60 to 90 minutes. And we are working with the providers and we're right now and welcoming the input on um, determining uh, the optimal dates and times for these forums. Um, the forums will be designed to define cultural competence, linguistic competence, diversity, equity and inclusion, and gauge the extent gauge the extent to which each of, I'm sorry, which is, uh, which is implemented among New York's network of IDD service providers and elicit input on the successes and challenges of implementing policies and practices that support cultural competence, competence linguistic competence, equity, and inclusion within their respective organizations. Uh, Georgetown University will analyze findings from the forums and develop a comprehensive report with a recommendation to advance our system capacity. And this report will be publicly available, including a plain language version. Georgetown University is also designing a process to help providers engage in organizational self-assessment and receive technical assistance. The assessment um, the Georgetown University will be using is called the Cultural and Linguistic Competence Assessment for Disability Organization. And it will, um, uh, it will ask providers to work for them to first modify the assessment and then implement their self-assessment process. And um, at the same time, Georgetown will provide technical assistance uh, to the uh, to organizations as they implement the self-assessment process. The goal of self-assessment process will be to create and implement an action plan. And um, uh, they will provide technical assistance on how to develop and implement the action plan based on organizational and self-assessment results. Uh, in April, um, uh, there will be a webinar for, for all providers to attend and to learn more about opportunity for self-assessment, technical assistance, regional forms, and it will be made available and all resources will be available to our agencies. And finally, the last thing that I want to mention is um, uh, that uh, the Guidehouse, I'm moving to self-direction program evaluation. So Guidehouse, uh, was selected to evaluate our self-direction program. Um, and Guidehouse will recommend the ways to simplify and strengthen um, the service model and make it workable option for many more people, including people from the diverse cultural and language backgrounds and those without the support of family. And I'm very excited because we do hear a lot of uh, a lot of we are getting a lot of feedback about our self-direction program, and hopefully um, we can simplify our model that will um, increase the enrollment and the use of it. So um, that's it for me for today. And um, are there any questions? 
Thank you, Nina. I think there are a few. Um, I have one question, and then there's a couple of hands up and a question in the chat. For the, the website that you started with, I put the links in the chat for the More Than Work, the DSP campaign. It was great. Heaven's Hands participated because we work with Vibrant, though mm -hmm. we're definitely in some mm -hmm. videos. But with the website, um, can you please definitely share who to email? Because I noticed, mm -hmm. specifically for us, when I looked at the, the website, when you click on Heaven's Hands, it doesn't take you anywhere. Okay. Some of the other agencies, it takes you to their apply online site, things like that. So I don't know if they put our address wrong. So definitely I would like to just make sure that's corrected. Okay. 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 Let me um, share the email, our communications um, uh, office email. Okay. We'll do that. And then there was a question in the chat from Gregory. Um, when you were talking about the COLA, he said there was a COLA for self-directed self-hire staff last year. Are you referring to another new COLA? Well, well, the survey that went out for uh, last year, COLA, right? Uh, for 2023, COLA, the survey was released in November and is due by April 1st. The COLA for, for 2022 was finally approved. Um, uh, and uh, the delays we had because of the changes that had to go into the waiver, right? So, uh, 5.4 increase um, of COLA that was approved three, uh, as of 2022. Um, uh, the fees and uh, rates uh, for April 1st, 2023 COLA, 4% COLA, have been paid to providers. The April 1st, 2023 rates uh, went in the payment cycle, uh, check number 2402 with a check release date of September um, 20th, 2023. In April 1st, 2023, fees were in payment of cycle 2403 with a check release date of September 27. I hope it makes sense to you. And hopefully that clarified for you, um, Gregory. And Carrie has her hand up with a question for you. Hi, this is Carrie Banks from the Brooklyn Public Library's Inclusive Services. Uh, Nina, you had mentioned a new resource for providers and parents, I think, on um, sexuality. Uh, and uh, I'm wondering if that's something that we can share publicly on our website, the Brooklyn Public Library's website. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I can. I will send you the link to the Great. website, and I and um, um, we can. Um, it probably would be the link. I can connect with our communications office and just ask them if that is possible, how we can share that information. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Carrie. Debbie? So Nina, I put the link, the communication link into the chat already. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Debbie, you have a question? Yes. Well, it's more like a morning, Nina. It's I want you to know that we've been enjoying seeing the commercial about what direct care professionals have been on TV. I mm. mean, all weekend long, my son and I like to binge watch, uh, you know, Bar Rescue and a few other. And we really loved seeing that. We liked that campaign. It was a very good campaign. So I just wanted to give you a thumbs up. And mm. this is really fast. I'll do more on the report. When the Advisory Council's website, which is being fixed right now, then we will, whatever links you need us to do, we will. Mm -hmm. We enjoyed that. We're enjoying seeing that commercial because people don't realize the important job that direct care professionals do for our, mm -hmm. for mostly for our individuals, but also for the family. So mm -hmm. it's really positive. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. And I've gotten great feedback from my staff. They've seen themselves or their parents have seen them and called them. And it seems like it's showing most on channel seven. But just mm -hmm. seeing the look and the reaction on my staff's face, like they understood they were being part of a project. They didn't mm -hmm. understand how big it was going to become. And mm -hmm. it, it really makes a difference because now they're showing it to all their friends and family. And mm -hmm. that alone is going to help spread the word aside from mm -hmm. the other intention of getting people that don't know our field. Mm -hmm. So it was great. Uh, Rochelle, you have a question. I do. I, I also want to uh, thank OPW for this uh, joint initiative for recruitment of DSPs. I think it's a wonderful initiative. Um, I'm going back to the self-direction COLA. Mm -hmm. uh, 
because I uh, work with a lot of people in self-direction. And um, I wanted to clarify something you said. You said, and I assume you were referring to last year's 4% COLA, not the two year ago, 5.4% COLA, but you said people had the option of using the four, the money to either pay their support broker or their staff to increase the rates for either of those two. Was I, did I hear correctly? Yes, yes. Individuals okay, so have, then, yeah, okay. have the choice to increase the support broker fee or the wages of self-hired staff by 5.4%. Well, 5.4 was two years ago. That's why yeah. I had one confusion. Yeah. What about yeah. last year's poll of 4%? For, um, I, I would assume that that would apply to the last year call as well. Yeah, because people I know paid out their their five point four already to you know they got that already but they haven't gotten the four percent so I'm kind of assuming that's it. But my question is, what if somebody wanted to split the cola between give some to the support broker and some to the their um, comhab workers? Is mm -hmm. is that allowed? I I would think yes, but. Let me go back and yeah, ask our staff, and I can respond to that later. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I don't see any other questions for you, Nina. So thank you so much for your update. Thank you, Brian. All right. Next, we have Richard from IAC with his update. Good morning. Um, and I know just on that 4% COLA, there is a specific website on OPWDD about the 4% COLA. Um, so I'll go back and look at that to clarify it. I know the 5.4%, there was a memo recently about self-direction and, uh, and the brokers. Um, so I'll just go back and look at that too. It gets, gets confusing. Um, anyway, um, I posted in the chat, it should be the very first post about um, we're planning an April 3rd rally in the well up at the legislative office building. And that's in case the budget is not passed by April 1. We don't think it will be given that that's the Easter weekend and uh, legislators might use that as a uh, an excuse to buy another week or two before the budget's officially passed. So depending on what's going on, there will be a rally. Uh, the link is there to register for that rally. And I think the main issues in the uh, OPW world will probably be the direct, uh, direct workers uh, wage enhancement, direct support wage enhancement. I got my acronym mixed up. Uh, and um, Hold on one second. Silence the phone. Um, and right now, that the direct support wage enhancement uh, is not in the uh, Assembly's uh, one house budget. Uh, it is in the Senate's, uh, and that's to add. Um, the, the ask was to add four thousand dollars per DSP in the budget as a uh, wage uh, increase, uh, the uh, Senate is proposing a uh, $2,000 employee uh, increase in 2024 and up to $4,000 in 2025. But they're also saying it's limited to those who earn under 75,000 uh, or 75,000 or under. So uh, we'll get that clarified, but that'll be the one topic uh, for the rally, uh, we'll also see if uh, the rally will talk about uh, the proposed COLA. You know, the governor proposed a 1.2% uh, cost of living increase. Uh, we've been asking for 3.2. Both houses put that in their budget, but they've uh, added additional language that they want the agency to attest to the fact that uh, that'll solely be used to increase the wages of non-executive direct care staff or DSPs or clinical staff. Um, 
And that was just added at the last minute, and it comes at the request of uh, um, one of the major unions uh, representing employees. And what uh, we were hoping is the same language as they've used in past years, uh, that that's a priority to go to direct support workers, uh, but the agency can use it um, to cover other expenses. You know, in the past, well, every year you get increases in insurance and maintenance and everything else. So it's, um, we have to get across the fact that uh, agencies are running a business and um, and the past uh, distribution of the increases, like the 4%, OPW did a survey and the DSPs um, averaged like a, over 7% increase and other monies went to other um, areas. But that's uh, April 3rd will be at rally. We'll get uh, information out there on that. Um, I'm not sure if the rally will include the early intervention issue. Uh, the assembly looks for a 11% increase and a 4% differential for underserved areas. Uh, but the Senate um, didn't include the EI. Um, so we'll be pushing that. Um, there's also a rally. I don't have the link for it. I'm trying to get it. Um, there's other groups that want to have a, they're going to have a rally uh, on March 27th having to do with OMIG. And they're going to have people, and they're looking for people to testify how OMIG audits um, had a negative impact on their agency, mainly where OMIG audits would find something like a typographical error um, for so much money, but then extrapolate that um, and it would really hurt the agency. Omega was created to uh, identify fraud in the system, and we we're all behind that. Uh, but typographical errors and other technical errors uh, shouldn't be penalized. Um, so, uh, on the OPW budget also, um, there was a proposal from the governor's office having to do with DSP nursing tasks being delivered in non-certified settings, primarily uh, the Medicaid administration. Uh, both houses uh, rejected that proposal. So we don't expect to see that um, coming forward again, uh, unless it's next year. I have to do more work on that. In the education world, um, Department of Ed or State Ed doesn't have to submit its budget to Division of Budget until April 15th, um, but they've been more uh, outgoing and, and forward with what they're proposing. Um, they are um, pretty much in step with what uh, providers are looking for. They are working on a rate methodology increase, uh, improvement. And they're um, they were proposing I think 2027 it would be all completed and implemented, and the um, the Senate wanted to move that up uh, by one year, which we're of course in favor of. Um, in New York City, we of course we have the preschool enhancement uh, issue, where a little over a year ago there were additional funds added to child care programs, including the 4410 uh, preschools, which allow the preschools to increase the wages of their teachers and teacher assistants um, between ten dollars and $20,000 a year, which brought them up to the starting salary of the Board of Ed teachers. Um, it had an immediate impact, an ongoing impact, that the uh, rate of retention uh, has improved. Uh, the number of vacancies has gone down. So it had the effect it wanted to. The problem was, is the city used all COVID money to fund that program. And now those funds expire on June 30th. City council's been working hard with provider associations, including IAC and Advocates for Children, uh, to replace that COVID money to keep those salaries in there. As you can imagine, Telling a teacher about a twenty thousand dollar increase that that's now going to be taken away will have a 
very devastating effect um, on the preschool system. Uh, city Council has been working hard to find a solution. Unfortunately, last week, the mayor in the uh, council hearings said he doesn't have the money for that. Uh, we question the fact that Department of Ed has a $37, $37 uh, billion dollar, uh, budget, and they can't find you know, 50 million for our preschools uh, to keep those teachers in place and uh, keep things uh, solid. Um, we've been working very hard for years and last year, it looked like we were finally getting this, the issue of sal salary parity approved, the council approved it. Um, and if they take this money back, salary parity is out the window. Uh, so we're gonna continue to fight hard for that. Um, and that's basically it. Um, if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Richard. I had reposted the link for the rally because it was early on and many people have joined after. Right. Okay. And if I get the rally about OMIG, uh, I'll post that. I'm not sure how many of you are interested in uh testifying at the omega rally but we'll, we'll get it up there and the oh the iac conference is may 15th and 16th uh it'll again be at the uja center on east 59th street um uh, it should be a very good event again and the early bird uh <coughs> price uh, ends on four fifth on april 5th uh, and I'm waiting for a good link to send to you on that also. And that's it. Thank you again. And there is a question from Chris. I see you, Chris. I don't hear you. I'm the winger in another meeting. Richard, I didn't hear back from you uh, regarding the um, from IEC regarding congestion pricing. Uh, regarding is IAC supporting it or what is what is your intake? Because I have you're the only one I actually of all the agencies I have not heard. I have heard from other agencies and I thank them who are here, but IAC I have not heard from you guys. And as you know, I'm going to be mentioning in my report this Wednesday is the voting. Okay, and I'm going to punt that question to Winnie. I saw something an email about it. Um, that will be me doing that. Guilty. No, no, this is from Winnie, but maybe you sent her something. Uh, I'll follow up on that, Chris. I'm sorry. It's just uh, given the limited staff IEC has now and all the other issues, uh, we're leaving it up to you to win that battle. Well, no, I am really, I am winning it. Find it. <laughs> just for the record, just to make sure because we're on recording, uh, there is a winning thing, but I do need you, IEC, and everyone else, which I'll mention in my report, that we do need everyone to please put that in the email to the MTA accessibility. That's on when Brian sent out earlier today. And I thank Brian for the DD Council sending that out. We're in support and I will, we'll get something out later. I got to touch base with Winnie. Thank you. All right, uh, Rochelle. Hi, just a little question, Richard, and thank you for your report. Um, for the OMIG rally, is it just for IDD providers or is it going to be broader? Because OMIG practice is the same way in every sector. I could tell you from my prior experience in OMGIR, it's exactly the same issues. So I was just wondering if there is any attempt to broaden the issue. I would assume so, but I haven't seen anything in writing about it. It was an announcement when he made it to membership meeting. Um, so hopefully I'll I'll get that link and get to post it. And, um, and if I get it, I'll also send it to you, Rochelle. Thanks, Richard. Yep. And then Richard, I don't see any other questions, but Carrie from Brooklyn Library said inclusive services can share out any information you have. So well, if you want to get her information, she can get it out for you. Okay. And 
Mass, I want to just do a special welcome to our new city representative, Marissa McMillan. Uh, Marissa, if you're not aware of it, for our old timers, um, just want to let you know that the city used to play a very major role in the funding of IDD programs in the city. And uh, hopefully um, we'll get that support again in the future. Also in the, the five-year plan every year, there was the local government plan got, you know, you guys got together with the DD councils, created the priorities uh, for services. So uh, we can brief you on that. I know Brian will uh, pull you aside and get things moving. But it's, it's good to see the city representative again. Thank you. Debbie, you have a question? Yes. Uh, Richard, you forgot that we, the advisory councils were also in that budget priorities too. Right. So welcome to our new person from New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The advisory councils are where five of us in the bar in, in New York City I chair Brooklyn, and we work very hard to work with the agencies to make sure the funding is done for the families and to keep the programs working. Thank you. All right. I don't see any other questions. Thanks so much for your update, Richard, and for joining us. You're welcome. All right. Before we hand it over to our presenter, I know... I introduced Rihanna from DOHMH. Is there anything you have for us, Rihanna, for this meeting? Oh, hello? No, I have nothing to report um, at this time from okay. the DOHMH side. All right, thank you. All right, so now I will pass it over to Natalia Lisoy from AHRC, and she's going to do a presentation on support it it's it a program um you can clarify it's, i don't want to introduce okay. it wrong <laughs> okay no worries i just want to share my screen just give me one moment please i'm probably have to make you a co-host one second okay Great. Can everyone see? Um, we can. Okay, great. So it's AHRC NYC's Queens and Brooklyn Intensive Parent Training Program. They're in both boroughs. In AHRC, we have um, we just did a new branding. And so just to be more contemporary, modernize, or focus our goals on mission. So A for advocacy, H for humanity, R for the imagination and see for change. And I think it's significant for this program because it's a family governed organization. We have to find different ways to help support and build fulfilled lives of the individuals and families that we support. And one way to do that is with the parent intensive training program. We like to think that the future for our children is for them to grow up, have families of their own, work and succeed in life. and when our child is neurodiverse, we can't always see that same future that we would see for someone who's neurotypical. And this program challenges that for us to reimagine their future as having families. Um, I'm trying to go to the next slide. There we go. So we know that the position statement for HR, the ARC is that all adults, when provided access to appropriate and effective supports as needed, to fulfill the basic responsibilities of child rearing are more likely to be effective in their roles as parents. So it is possible. And we need to take the stigma away from it not being possible to being possible. And I was just at a transition meeting a couple of months ago, and it was actually in one of the schools, I think it was Clara Burton. And I was asking the, the teachers, are you encountering any students who are pregnant? And he was happy to say, no, it hasn't happened in a few years, which means it has happened in the past, more than likely to happen in the future. And there's a strong possibility 
that this ind individual may want to be a parent, which is only going to happen with child care giver support in the home if they're living with their parents and therefore the child would be living with the grandparents and outside services is and which is what we provide in the intensive training program. So what are the services? How do we participate in the family's lives? We actually go into the home and I should say we, I go into the home because that's where it's convenient for you. And the home environment is where parenting takes place on a large percentage. So it's in-home parent training. Depending on the age of the child, you can have teenagers. And anybody knows who has teenagers that they can be a little bit difficult and challenging in and of itself, that time of life. And so what, I can, what I've done is the discipline factor. How do I support mom, dad, and it's usually mom, in getting the child to follow the simple thing of making up your bed? And so I will have a conversation with mom. What is it that you want her to do? I want her to make up the bed. Okay, so what are the ways that she can be rewarded if she doesn't do this? And what's the discipline factor when she doesn't do this? Maybe it means she doesn't have a uh, TV over the weekend or she has to go to bed maybe a half hour earlier, things like that. What do they see and what do they like? And then helping them advocate for that for themselves. Like I can be a mom and I can enforce these rules and then helping them with little tools that can keep them on track so there's a chart, something like that. So this helps the parent, and then also reminds the child, teenager, you have to follow these rules. So it's that's the idea of in-home parent training and behavior management. And the behavior management is also provided beyond the home and supporting the families. So think about the DOE. Most of these kids are in the public school system. There's parent-teacher conferences. There's keeping up with their, their kids' doing their homework? Are they actually going to school? And it's helping them to form a healthy relationship with the child's school and the teachers to make sure that they're involved and that the teachers and the schools know that mom and dad are involved. Another thing that I think is very important that we take for granted if you're neurotypical is that children model your behavior. And so there have been instances where I actually go in and I play with the kids, with mom. Simple things like heads, shoulders, knees, and toes, that can really help a child learn my head, my shoulders, my knees, my toes, and things like that. And that also forms an engagement, which attachment is important and necessary, as we know, for child rearing. It's also important to have books in front of the child. And it is difficult for this particular population in modeling because of they know how they are viewed by our community outside, how their community views them. There's stigma, there's shame attached to it. And it's also part of the work is to help them not carry that shame and carry that stigma to empower them to know that they can be a parent. And the easiest thing is through play because that's how neurotypical and neurodiverse can learn to parent. And one of the other th things a mom did ask me was she wanted the child to learn how to climb up the stairs because it was a two, um, it was one family home with two floors. And what can happen is that you don't want to hurt your child. So you start carrying your child up the stairs and it's 18 months approaching two years, 24 months, and you're still doing this. So there's ways that we work to help with the child rearing in that direction. And I found that YouTube is pretty amazing when a parent can see how it's done, not just in front of them, but they can see how a child does that on their own. So I think we just brushed on um, the advocacy and intensive case management. So this is all about empowering the caregiver to self-advocate and advocate for their family members. So what's required, what's the eligibility? They must meet the requirements as set forth by the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, as we all know, OPWDD. So it has to be the parent who's living with the intellectual developmental disability. That doesn't mean their child can't have um, an IDDD. That may happen. It's likely to happen, and I've encountered that. 
parents, but it must be the parent. And you should be living in the home with the grandparents and must reside in Queens or Brooklyn for the corresponding program. What's needed in the referral packet? We need current psychological eval indicating the individual's intellectual developmental diagnosis and a complete current medical report stated within the year, all pertinent medical information, including medications received. It is, it's necessary for when we go into the home to know what medications are in the home. A current TB PPD results, and as well, the other eval is the psychosocial report within the year of the submission date. So it is a process of getting in. Um, all these things must be checked off. And of course, usually I'm working with the care managers who know their clients best, and I'm working with them to figure out, because we need to know what is the parent looking for? What are their needs that they're hoping to be met? So again, these services are free to any family who, again, lives in Queens or Brooklyn, which I think is very helpful. Their waiver services are not needed for this. So just remember that the discrimination towards individuals who live within IDD was segregation, involuntary sterilization of adolescents and adults, and using legal means to remove and deny parents the opportunity to raise their children in a home, which we have seen recently um, with ACS and there was a lawsuit and it ended, it's a catch-all, but parents who are living with an IDD were having their children removed. We have to rethink how we view parents with an IDDD and we have to recognize if they want to go out and work, we are giving them the opportunities and the assistance to help them with. If they want to go to school, we are making those opportunities present and available because we know they can't do it. And it's the same thing with parenting. They can do this with the right supports. So that's my information. Annette Spilino is the supervisor of the program. Reach out if you have any questions, concerns, or if you have someone you know who would be ready for this kind of program. And yes, Deborah, you raised your hand. Yes, I did. I'd like to know, have you been working with the ACS Developmental Disability Unit run with, with Clip, who Clip Dates is? Um, as of now, I don't believe so, no. And I'm very disappointed, and I'll tell you why. ACS has those programs, and they do because I have a lot of families who live in my building with children under 18 with the balance ability, and they come in and give a lot of help and support and services. So I really feel that you're doing a disservice to the families because you should have reached out to their developmental disability unit and also the disability unit, and they do work with well, not just only our population, but the other populations too. And they can well, try to prevent children from being removed from home. Well, like I said, it, not as of right now, no. But that doesn't mean something can't change for the future. Well, I hope you do end up meeting with him. Yes, I'll thank you. I'll email. bring it to you. I will put the email, his email in the chat. But really, I'm, I am a little disappointed because I know HRC has worked and you usually reached out so that you didn't. Then I'm very disappointed. Right. Well, I, I can only speak very. to what's taking place now. And that is something that will be looked into. But the program's been in existence for more than 10 years, and that's why I'm there. The, the ACS program, I actually, right. the Brooklyn program, we were not, we didn't receive the grant to do this until the past year. And um, the Queens program, I couldn't speak to how long it's it's been in existence, because oh. when I joined, it was AHRC, it was in existence already. And I can't speak to prior to my joining, if it, there was a relationship, but I can only say for now, there isn't one, but that doesn't mean it cannot change for the future. And you should also be made aware that that ACS unit also, when children with developmental disabilities are in foster care, they oversee and help the families too. They can't take use family support services, but there are other programs they can use. So I'll put the, his name and email in the chat. For you. Well, if it's you're saying if they can't they can't use no, family I said support. foster care, foster, foster care, foster care. My son, if he was under eighteen right now could get any family support because he's my natural living child living with me. 
They take care of children who live at home with their families, with development abilities, who may need housekeeping or other services, but for, they also oversee the foster care for children with developmental disabilities who are under a different type of division. Those children get funding every month, foster care only. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, thank you. I've made a note of it and I'll speak to my supervisor. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, Chris, you had your hand up. Yes, I just want to echo one thing uh, because I'm looking at my records here. Uh, for the training systems, you guys did used to work with Cliff Davies, but you also worked with, I forget her name. She's been the one I mentioned to you um, during another, another somewhere else. But I will strongly will say this. Please make sure you work with the ACS Development Disabilities Division because they we've been working with them for a long time and we need to make sure that communication. Second, I like the word you mentioned advocate on your PowerPoint. That I like very much because at least you know it doesn't matter which advocate you're talking about, they're all different types of advocates. So I like the word advocate there very much. Right. It's about program for self-advocacy and we also advocate, excuse me, advocate for our clients, our families. Yeah, because it's, mm -hmm. yes. And the reason why I'm saying advocate, because I am one is not a self-advocate. I'm a regular advocate for disability for over 30 years. And I just want to be very clear that there were all different types of advocates out there. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. And mm -hmm. It was, we're promoting also for the parents to self-advocate as first and foremost, so that they they're empowered to do that. As well, well because, I call them I call them parent advocate because or legendary advocates, because parent to me is a parent with a child with a disability, or if a if a person is an individual who has a disability, is an advocate for disability. Right, but when I say self-advocacy, and I think um, it's needed to know that it's the parents who are living with a disability who are raising their families. So the component of self-advocacy is about advocating for their family's needs in different systems. And the DOE is one such system. Medical health care is another system. So it's being able to have the empowerment to self-advocate, not just for yourself, but for your children, for your family. And with necessary supports, that is possible. I don't know right, there there is a question in the chat. Um, do you know if anyone is providing this service in other boroughs? I believe there are in other boroughs, but AHRC um, is only working in Queens and Brooklyn as of now. It might be that might be that would be a question for OPWD. Yeah. All right. Any other questions for Natardia? I don't see any hands up or anything in the chat. So thank you so much. Thank for you. the presentation. It was great, very helpful. Thank Hopefully you. families reach out and take advantage. Thank you for the opportunity. It's really appreciated. Happy Monday. All right. Next, we don't have any other presenters. Are there and I know some people came on late with the login issue. Are there any other committee updates for the Brooklyn Council? Any of our other co-chairs on that want to plug a meeting or talk about something going on? Go ahead, Hi, good evening, everyone. Oh, good morning. Oh. I'm winter evening already. This is Lucina Clark, um, executive director of By Time Inc., also legislative chair. We had our last meeting on March 13th, and I'm so excited. But the, the team is getting bigger, the committee, and ideas are really flowing. The last idea we had was to really connect um, Miss Willis, Maria Willis, and I. She's my co chair. We are formatting a letter to speak to our representatives in Brooklyn um, right now, because as we look at having the legislative branch next year, it's focusing on the boroughs because we have to really target our borough electives where we are. So they know exactly what, what is going on in our borough. And one of the thing is we're gonna have, we're considering having like a session where parents know who your council member, I mean, your council member or your state or your senator, because it's very important for you to contact them, not wait until when March comes next year. You know, we're arguing about what should we get during legislation, but having the opportunity to just contact your legislators 
say hello, know that you have a child with a disability and what are they doing? So we are trying to get uh, meetings with the representatives we have right here in Brooklyn, one-on-one -on -one face connections with them, the committee, to see how can we support them, how they can support us. Building a relationship, that's what happens, building relationships. I want to thank a lot of you who are some of the providers who participated last, like two weeks ago. It was really awesome. So thank you again. You know, my email is lucina at I'll put it in the chat if anyone have any ideas. Please, it's about building, building communities, about sharing the ideas, how we can connect. So thank you, Brian, again, for the wonderful work you're doing. Thank you. And, and thank you to Maria Willis from um, as UCP used to be. So I want to thank her for being our co-chair and everyone who has participated in the committee. Thank you all. Uh, Lucina, before you go, I know there's been some issues the last couple of months with the, the Zoom links. Are you guys going back to Zoom? Are you guys going to be using Chris's um like you know i what, ring I, like, I like chris's the ring central they're getting everything and also you can print out the meeting you know the meetings of the meeting which is really exciting so we can yeah because we're having some issue with the zoom i don't know what was happening but i think we because they are on before us so we can just slip in you know after so i think that'll be great so thank you chris also and deborah for allowing us to use Jan rose for allowing us to use your your link as well it goes it's, it goes in really smoothly. I like that. So thank you. So you don't have that's one less stress, Brian. Um, Brian, so then I'll make I say, sure I update. Uh, uh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I just want to add. I just I just want to add something between Deborah and Lucina. I don't know if Rose is here, but there was a discussion to do a next month a joint meeting with both committees because it is information and it's dealing with like uh, like trying to get more families and agencies to get to the elected officials so there is a discussion of a joint meeting uh Deborah can you bounce that please sure first of all we first of all Lucia if you everyone can hear me we were very happy to assist because it made it smoother and with we I will be speaking to us but yes I believe we will be able to join together to work so that we can also, since part of our role is the information family provider, so we can figure out our plan because as, as I kept bringing up to Lucina, which she did not disagree with me, is that we can't just advocate during budget time. We have to be there all year round because we need to make sure the elected officials, but really important is their staff, whether they're here down in the down here in our borough or even where they're upstate they need to know who we really are mm -hmm. and they need to see like we want to also show that we work together like a family goes and say with their care manager hi this is Deborah Grife this is my care manager as you know my son Christopher picture and everything and these are needs and we're going to work very hard because we want them to understand the needs for the when our children live at home for family support services and why we need the profession like a direct care professional that does either comhab or respite why is it needed so that our family can make sure if you know their day habs many times the ones who are at day have their program in so early and the parent can't get home from work until say six o'clock but you have that person who's a respite worker there with the child so that's very important we need for them to understand they also like to mix us up and they still do it with mental health. I'm nothing against mental health. Please don't don't think of putting mental health down. Because many of our parents, like me, I need help with mental health from stress. But my child has a developmental disability. He is recognized to receive services from OPWDD. So that's why we're all going to work together. And Lucine, it's very easy. No problem. Chris is very good at getting Ring Central. Everybody can come and join. And the meeting will be on. Wednesday, March, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, April, let's say it's April 10th. 10th. Yes, 10th. Day, day. Yeah, April 10th. Please join us at 10 a.m. for that's when the family provider, but technically Lucina's is 11, starts at 11. It's 11, yes. Well, join early, join early so we can do this together. And yeah. while I'm here, first of all, so real quick, I'm going to update the website so the link will oh. be the same for both yours and, and her and the legislative committee so no one will get confused going forward. Yes. 
This makes a lot Thank of you. sense. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I just want to say that our last meeting, the family provider, was on March 13th, and we did have Nick from PHP. He did a great explanation of what his agency serves, and it was very informative. A lot of the, the care managers people were on were very impressed. So that went really well. Do you want me to do the advisory now just to get it out of the way? Sure. Okay. The advisory, first of all, I'm going to give the update for the statewide that was held on Wednesday, March 6th. Yes, we. Um, I want you to know there was an election for the statewide chair for the two, we have two co-chairs and our secretary. The two co-chairs, as you know, Kathy Nowak from Staten Island, and her co-chair is Gail Paddle. She's from the Broome area. And then from region, I feel like it's one western part of, the, or western eastern part of region four. I'm sorry, not region one is Ann Sheriff. She's going to be the recording secretary. We heard the sad news that our commissioner is, is leaving. We're very sad and brokenhearted. The other issue I want everyone to know, we are, we it brought up about issues with the ADM reimbursements. So everybody who have issues, please keep sending those emails. But you have issues with the program, please contact Angela Blades or Robin Mooney, when you are having trouble with the reimbursement program. But we are working very hard, the statewide, as well as ours. We also met on the April, no, I'm sorry, March. I'm so sorry about that. We held up March 19th. Yeah, and we discussed about, and this is really important, I'm going to ask everybody, please email. We have, we are going to be, there's a big possibility we may be able to do RFPs for family support programs. I would like to know what your priorities and what you feel are important for the family support programs. Example, reimbursement, emergency respite, um, in-home, uh, com you know, when you want to have your apartment or house, you need to make adjustments physic for the physical or housing advocacy. Those are examples. So please email me at bfssac at yahoo.com and as you know also as i said before monday march april 15th we will be having our resource fair at the greenport library thanks to inclusive services thank you carrie the next day yes the advisory council will be holding our meeting on ring central yes we're very very busy and it will be we ask everyone to try to get on at 9 45 but if, please everybody Email me the if you have issues or you want about with the reimbursement ADM. We are fighting very hard to put more things back in that need to be added in. Like example, when a child has incontinence problems and they need a new mattress or other, like we are working on that. Now, I'm not saying we're, we guarantee it'll be fixed, but we want you to know we're willing to work and we're advocating, but I need to know the issues for this area. Also, please let me know what you feel about the RPs and what are what family support programs you feel should be funded. Again, my email is bfssac at yahoo.com. If you can't find me, contact Christopher. He always can find me somehow. All right. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, Debbie. And it just reminded me, I just want to quickly say, um, Lisa Veglia, who is the chairperson of the Queen City Council, and I have been having communication with Delia Tucker, who's the Region 4 Director for OPWDD. I know over the last couple of months, there's been a lot of questions and concerns regarding the ADM that came out last summer for eligibility. Yeah. So we have brought many of those concern concerns forward directly to Delia. Um, and she is trying to work with her team to put a meeting together. Um, and I don't know who will be involved yet, but at least that way we can kind of get some answers or maybe get a recording out of it that we can share across the boroughs because it seems like there's some different information being shared depending which borough you're asking. And then just overall confusion regarding some of the language and the wording within the ADM and how it impacts eligibility in the OPWDD world. So Lisa and I are working on that. There's been some emails back and forth. Delia is aware of some of the concerns and issues. So hopefully we'll have some more information for you all soon. Oh, Brian, I need, I've got to have one more thing. 
as you know, besides being a statewide family support uh, council, there's also the statewide developmental disabilities council called DDAC. They have a a health committee, and their health committee has been in agreement. That the piece I kept bringing up is doctors need to know what do you mean by justification for items for, that may be medically needed, but they want what kind they want to. We, everybody's going to try to work on a form so doctors can know. And the guidelines, so this way, when it is put in for reimbursement, let's say you need a certain OT device to keep it home so a child can keep working out or on, or like they need those special spoons or something to attach to it, that's pretty, but they want to make sure that there is a good justification on, and what, what, how are they supposed to do it for OPWDD? Because it's different when the child has no development abilities, has physical disabilities, or has mental or emotional. So we want all justifications medically explained and to have a form and also a guideline. So thank you, Brian, for letting me bring that up. No problem. Thank you for your update, Debbie. You're welcome. Uh, next, or any questions for Debbie? I don't see. Uh, Brian, this is Chris. Just to remind, uh, there is one thing Deborah left out. I don't even know if I hear her clearly. Just to remind everyone that the Developmental Disability Resource Fair is on April 15th. Uh, certain agencies who are here who did not RSVP, please do me a favor and respond to that email because the deadline is the end of this week. If you don't respond, I have to put someone else in their place to fill the slots. So there are some of you who already did. I see two or three people in my third screen. Thank you. But there is someone else who has not. Please, please respond back. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I just want to be very clear because somebody put it in the chat to me. Thanks, Chris. Uh, no questions, I see. So, Chris, turn over to you for MTA. And good morning, everyone. As I saw my screen going off and on, I've been doing the MTA board, which you're hearing in the background, which I'm muting because one person is acting very inappropriate. Um, just to be very clear, that Brian, thank you, Brian, for sending out that report out. One of reminding everyone, uh, we do have something regarding the voting this Wednesday for the MTA congestion pricing. This is related for accessibility. I'm going to remind you that the voting for the MTA is this Wednesday. If you have certain questions, concern, I'm going to remind you to please, as that's already been sent out, is to please, please email this to the MTA accessibility because the MTA accessibility will give you an answer and a question. There is more details that are going in that will not affect agencies or people with disabilities and seniors, because what you're hearing on the news is the truck price, which is $15, which last time I checked, none of our cars are trucks. We're talking about the heavy duty ones that don't understand that drive safely. And you know, they've been causing a lot of accidents. And as of last year, we just got the number for 2023. The accident level is up by 90 8.8%. And I'm not just talking about one borough. The New York, this is all five boroughs. If I mention the New York State region, forget it. Don't even get me there. One of the, the other the other thing that MTA has been reporting is, is we are been opening up a lot of new accessible stations. That's one. Um, not just on the subways, but the railroads as well. I know Carrie's been excited as well. And MTA has been just started just two weeks ago, the Accessory Omni card. Someone else are being the testers. No, I'm not a tester for the accessory because I'm not an accessory user, but Debbie is. Uh, the Omni card is being tested. And there was a question that somebody asked me in here. Uh, it was an agency. And I know this is from New York City Fairs asked me this question as well. Can I put two Omni cards into one account? The answer is yes, because they're both traveling cards because they're, di they're, they're different brains in the card. It's just like your regular credit card, it's a separate credit card. Meaning I can put my reduced fare and my accessory. If I have to carry my son or daughter, young child's on the reduced fare card, can I put that in there? Yes, because it's a traveling card. Remember, they're minors, meaning you have control of their account. So be on the alert on that information. It has been going around. Some people maybe got confused but I was correct when I said this months ago. And I'm gonna remind everyone, 
please check the facts if you're not sure, because a lot of people like to listen to the news media. And I'm going to tell you, not all the news has it correct or they don't listen on that. Um, for people between the border of Brooklyn and Queens, and Brian, this is related to you because you answered this question uh, three months ago. As of today, until April 16th, we have the Queens redesign final plan just came out. I am going to remind everyone, there are some buses that do operate in Brooklyn, goes into Queens. Please check those. And if you're having a problem, if you're that concerned about a bus stop that is being removed, not just the MTA, you have to let them know, but Edmund, who is the accessibility DOT, he needs to hear this too. And making sure that notes are going in. And I'm going to remind you to please let the MTA know, as well as MTA accessibility, as well as your elected officials in your area. Because some of the buses may be added routes, some are being changed. So I will suggest you please look at it very carefully. And this is also people going into the Bronx to Queens, because those buses are not changing, but they are going to run a little more frequently. So if you have comments, you, you can do it today until April 16th. And please be on the alert that holidays are coming up. And I will remind you to please check your track works that are coming up for any service changes. We still have the R211T running on the C line. We still have more of the new computer trains. And there is a question that was mentioned. All the trains exact the A train cars, some of the Cs, we do have two or three of them, some on the Q trains, and some on ends that call the R46. Those do not have cameras. But the B but the D train, the B train, as you know, those are car 68s and 68A. 68A is from Kawasaki. Those have cameras. The difference is you you don't see a top light on top of the ceiling anymore. That is now the camera, meaning I'm watching Brian or Carrie on the train. You don't even know when I'm going to be on that train, being watching you. Or I'm watching Paola running on the B train at 34th Street. <laughs> I'm just giving you guys an example. But the newer computer trains do have the cameras. So please, guys, all the stations have cameras. All the buses have cameras. If a bus goes out of service because the camera is not working, it's because of your safety on this. I hope anyone has any questions right now and say your piece. But just remind everyone, this Wednesday, MTA Board will be doing the final voting on the congestion pricing. If you want to 10, I wish you good luck because I'll be there. But I'm just going to remind you, it will be ultra mega packed. And just to be safe. Thank you, uh, Brian. If Brian or Rochelle or Marilyn, if you guys have any questions, I'm here. All right. Thank you, Chris. I don't see any mm -hmm. questions at this point. Thank you for your MTA update. So I will open it up for agencies that want to make announcements. Go ahead, Doris. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Doris Khan, and I am the Outreach Coordinator for New York State Institute on Disability. We're a family support agency. We provide evaluations for non-Medicaid individuals who are seeking OPWDD eligibility and who reside in the four boroughs, Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx, and Staten Island. Please contact Liz Sunshine at 917-699-0578. Also, we provide behavior crisis management for individuals residing at home in the five boroughs. Contact Juliet Hawkins at 917-524-4856. Uh, we also provide reimbursement services for goods and camp. I know it doesn't feel like camp is around the corner, but it is. And if you're looking to place your child in camp, whether sleep away or day camp, we provide reimbursement for those services. Camp has to be in New York State. You cannot, the camp cannot um, get any funding from anywhere else, like waiver for it. and. Also, the camp, and this is important, has to have a 
Department of Health certificate. There are some local day camps within our boroughs. They're, they do not necessarily have the Department of Health certificate. So that's important if you want reimbursement for that. We also have tickets for recreational outings. The weather's gonna get nicer and families might wanna take advantage of that. Call Sarah Alton at 718-494-9424. For reimbursement, I didn't mention, contact Jackie Tripodi at 929-202-1115. We also provide free transportation services for medical appointments for individuals who live in Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. The phone number is John O'Grady at 917-747-94. To four. This transportation is also available for anyone who wants to take their family on a recreational outing. I put um, the contact info in the chat. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you, Doris. Carrie? Hi, all. I have posted a bunch of things earlier on in the meeting, and but I really want to highlight one thing in particular, and that is... Um, the pause painting event. Pause is a group, is a social uh, group meetup for individuals who are non-speaking adults. And they're gonna be doing painting this time around. Um, they meet monthly in one of our libraries. This month they'll be at the Greenpoint Library um, and their uh, registration and information and such is in the chat. Um, this, is, uh, this group is part of Autistic Adults NYC. Um, and it's it's just been some really exciting events. And I know there are not a lot of recreation opportunities, especially not inclusive recreation opportunities out there for non-speaking adults. So please share with everybody you know. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. I just posted the link again for them as well. Oh, and so did you. <laughs> Any other announcements from anyone? Program openings, exciting events coming up. Family Support Fair, June 5th. Sign up. Register. Professionals can attend for free. Individuals, family members all can attend for free. We'll have some light refreshments. There's 18 agencies signed up as of right now. Wednesday, June 5th, back at Brooklyn College. Um, excuse me, Brian. This is Chris. I'm sorry to interrupt, but somebody asked me this question. Uh, and I did forget to mention that I did get promoted. Uh, my uh, title for MT Accessibility, can I say it? Yeah. Uh, just to let everyone know, because I know I don't know what Cena's talking or not, I can't tell. Um, just to let everyone know, the answer to your question, yes, I have been promoted to the new MTA. I'm still on the accessibility, but now I did, now my title is brand new. It's called Community Outreach Officer. Meaning I deal not just subways and buses, I deal with all divisions. Like when I was acting for Eden almost three years ago. Now I am officially, so I know more things in the if people don't realize that I know the truth. So, and I know a lot of people are clapping, thank you, in the sign language way too, as Carrie did earlier. Uh, but just to make it very clear to everyone, nothing has changed what I've been doing. I just get an, uh, I means I still have access to subways and buses and but also the railroads as well so i will have more details in the i'll be sending out the next report when it comes available but again thank you everyone yes. for your support thank you thank you chris yes. and congrats on your brian? new position brian yes go ahead Hi, this is Sandy Naper. I'm on the meeting by phone. Can I make a couple of announcements? Of course. Okay. Um, great. So Adapt Community Network is having two great webinars coming up soon. One is this Thursday, March 28th from 10 to 12, and it's called Needs, Wants, Dreams, and Wishes. Gary Schulman will be the speaker. And the following Thursday, April 4th, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., we're having Unlocking Possibilities, Your Guide to OPWDD Supports and Services. 
our own Kate Gottlieb will be the speaker. And we do provide Spanish and Mandarin interpretation for all our webinars. And unfortunately, uh, registration is required. So if you would like to register for both of these webinars, please email familyconnect at adaptcommunitynetwork.org. Thanks very much, Brian. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks. You too. All right. It seems like everyone is about to get a half hour back. Oh, no, tardy to God. I'm sorry. I forgot to mention that I'm a licensed creative arts therapist and a uh, credentialed RDT. So if that it makes, makes a difference about who's going in the home, I have that credentialing and licensure from New York State. Forgot to mention. Thank you. Thank you. And again, if anyone came on late and missed Natalia's presentation, the video will be posted on our website later today or tomorrow, as are all of our meetings. So if there's no one else, I don't see any hands. I don't see anything in the chat. So thank you, everyone, for attending. Please spread the word about our Family Support Fair coming up in June. Please register if you haven't already. And we will see everyone next month. Have a great week. April, April 15th. Thanks, everyone. You just need to find it. Let me find it. What? what? Oh. Brian, I'll see you. Thank you. Bye, Chris. Thank you. Enjoy your day, Brian. You too. Thank you. Bye.